Okay. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I'm Helga Pakasar. I'm the Audain Chief Curator at the Polygon Gallery. The Polygon Gallery is situated on the unceded ancestral territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. We are very grateful to be able to work on their lands and that we occupy. And we're also very grateful to continually learn from the cultures of Coast Salish peoples. Today's event is in the spirit of the Polygon's longstanding interest in bringing to light previously unknown histories of our region through photographs. It promises to reveal untold stories from Vancouver's cultural histories that otherwise might stay only in personal memories. In keeping with our ongoing support of local photography, OG Punk, the exhibition that inspired this conversation, showcases a new series by the established Vancouver photo artist and photojournalist, Dina Goldstein, who has documented life in our city for decades. Her compelling studio portraits, individually and together, offer clues to both our past and present. Through her compassionate eyes, key figures from the punk and indie music scenes of the 70s and 80s are portrayed as they want to be seen today. The portraits piqued my curiosity about the strong presence of influential women musicians in that era that brought up questions like, what was the relationship between their form of rebellion and feminism? Questions that called for strongly called for an investigation of the creative influences of the punk anti-establishment global cultural movement on local women musicians. So we will show a short video introduction with Dina Goldstein before handing the event over to Sukyun Lee. An original member of Vancouver's band, Bob's Your Uncle. Since then, Sukyun has been active as an actor actress, musician, filmmaker, VJ, and radio host. Last year, she released an album, Juge 2, on the Vancouver indie label Mint Records, featuring music with her late partner, Adam Litovitz. Recently, she has made a psychedelic melodrama film called Death and Sickness that is streaming on CBC Gem, and is currently working on an experimental comedy feature movie. Clearly, the pandemic has been an inspiring time for her. Now, just a few housekeeping matters. If you have questions or comments, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and address your questions to host at the Polygon Gallery. Near the end of the conversation, we will open up to your input. At last count, there are actually 300 <laughs> listeners here. And uh, finally, I want to extend a special thanks to the discussants and to our trusty technician, Michael Mann, and I also want to remind you that the exhibition ends tomorrow at 5 p.m. So you still have a chance to catch it. So now we will um, watch Dina and um, then over to Sukhyun. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Dina Goldstein. I'm pleased that my exhibition has opened up an opportunity for discourse on the subject of women in punk. When I started shooting the series OG Punk, I was enamored by the expression of individuality still evident and alive in my model collaborators. I began to photograph mostly men and was actively seeking women to participate. Wendy 13 was on board early and connected me to some of the key figures in the Vancouver punk scene. But again, they were mostly men in their 50s and early 60s. I did photograph Bev Davies, who was instrumental in documenting this era in our city, and Heather Healy, who is part of the conversation today. Heather herself was in a punk band and later became a poet and a published author. When I photographed Nardward, he held up a Dish Rags album, making a statement as not to forget these women, just teenagers from the island, who made a mark and broke conventions and opened up for The Clash and The Ramones when they came to play in Vancouver. I didn't have a chance to include any of these women in the OG Punk exhibition at the Polygon, but I made a plan to contact them for the next installation and continuation of the project. Although there were women 
that greatly contributed to the punk movement in the 70s and 80s, they were far and few in between. These women exuded confidence and vulnerability without having to take on the male punk aggression. They displayed attitude and innovated new sounds. They rocked just as hard as the male band counterparts and they inspired other women to continue making a mark in the music industry. However, they had to deal with demeaning catcalls from the audience and had to deal with persuasive sexism on the road from promoters, venue managers, and music press. The music industry, a systemic misogynistic environment, saw these female acts as novelties. Yes, they were opening up for the clash, but the dish rags and other female acts couldn't get past that being that opening act. I really look forward to this conversation today. Thank you. Oh, am I up? <laughs> Are we up? Take it away, Sukyun. Looks like it. <laughs> oh, that's we're not Sukyun, that's Heather. But um, I think we're all here. Um, I'm Sukyun. And thank you very much. That's Dina Goldstein, photographer of OG Punk, the exhibition of portraits at the Polygon Gallery up until tomorrow. Uh, so Kim Lee here with um, some incredible groundbreakers of music. Um, Jade Blade of the Dish Rags, they formed in 1976. She's got the brick wall behind her. Um, Heather Haley of the Zealots from 1979. Lots of books behind you, Heather. Mm -hmm. And also Vanessa Richards of the second gen 80s post-punk band Bolero Lava. Uh, Vanessa is from the same gen as me. We're second gen, they're first gen. I'd love for each of you, um, let's start off with Jill. Um, uh, uh, could you just describe yourself uh, in how you see fit? Sure, okay, hi everyone. And I wanna thank everyone for coming today too. That's quite a turnout. Um, so yeah, my, uh, my name, is, my punk name is Jade Blade. And the reason I'm here today is because I was a uh, member of a first generation punk rock band, the Dish Rags, all female punk rock band. And we existed, we did form in 76. We played um, actively from 1977 to 1980. And I'm really um, thrilled to be part of this event. So thanks. Heather? Hi, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for, for everyone for everyone being here. Uh, based, um, primarily I'm a poet uh, and uh, always been writing music and playing music too. I think there's a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship between verse and, and music. So I've always done both from a very tender age. And so I, uh, I'm a poet, songbird, media artist. That's, that's my tag. Thank you, Heather. And Vanessa? Yeah, thank you, Sukian. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Sukian, I'd like to just start with my own acknowledgement and I'll talk more about myself later. Um, so I just want to say, I just want to really greet you all so wholeheartedly from where I stand on the unceded, unsurrendered lands of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. I know that the polygon is sited in North Vancouver on Squamish territory and that it sits under the gaze of the Two Sisters Mountains, colonially known as the Lions. And I want to bring the Two Sisters into here because they were totally punk rock and they're smashing the patriarchy when they ask their people to stop with the war with their neighbors and they brought peace to the region and they stand there as sentinels of peace. So I want to start with those sisters in the house. I also want to do a shout out to some of the foundation women in this in this city who also smashed patriarchy and, and walls and things and brought things to change. And I wanna say the name of Eleanor Collins who had the first television show hosted by an African person of African descent in North America on Turtle Island. I wanna hail Thelma Gibson who brought African dance and drum to children all over the Vancouver area with my father, Rudolph Richards. I wanna also do a shout out to Afro-Indigenous soul sister, Delana Gail Bowen, who was making music in the 60s. I want to shout out to my sisters in Valero Lava, Barb Bernaff, Laurel Thackeray Card, Lorraine Finch, and then later Sherry Lee and Linda McRae and our eventual brothers, Andy Graffiti and Jeff Sawatsky and that tall, handsome one that I, I can't remember his name. I think we only ever rehearsed. I also want to give a special shout out to the other black woman playing music in this scene at that time, Pam Braithwaite from the band Quantum Leap 
also a band of women, speaking of women in music, there's this beautiful next fifth generation or whatever we want to call it of women making music right now, smashing things to smithereens and having a good, good, good kick at the can. So let me call the name of JB, the first lady, the sisters behind Bass Coast, Chris Dirksen, who just did one of the most beautiful soundtracks on the Knowledge Network, Untold History of BC. See it if you can. I want to shout out to Pac AD and Chelsea Johnson and Lola White from Old Soul Rebel, Kim Mortal and Tiffany Ayala. And I'm almost done. I want to congratulate you, Sukin, for your new album, Still Making Music. So proud of you. And I also want to acknowledge that we're standing in an art gallery in Zoom land right now and really notice that this is the first time in the history of my Black life in this city that I have seen so many Black artists being represented in galleries. So I want to shout out to the Polygon, particularly Justin Ramsey for his work in Infinite Interior, amazing exhibition, and also Jan Wade at the VAG if you haven't seen it yet, Curate Anaya Lewis, who's doing great work, and Becky Bear from Black Gallery. Thank Hello! You. Huzzah! Um, you're a, a, a beam of sunshine there. In, in my tube of darkness in, in Toronto. Um, so yeah, I mean, you uh, illuminate, uh, Vanessa, there's a continuity for every person, for each of us uh, represented on screen. There are billions of others. Uh, we're just part of a fraction of a small tip of this thing, this, this world, this life, a lot of con contribution. Um, <clears throat> so excited to have you here and so excited to have over 300 people involved in this very weird online thing as we sit in our uh, individual dwellings and homes and spaces. Um, the, everyone is in the chat. I'm seeing lots of people and it's a beautiful thing. So glad to have, you, have everyone here. Um, we heard from photographer Dina Goldstein. A couple of things really struck me. She had expressed her desire to include more women in her exhibition, OG Punk. Um, the exhibition itself and punk lore in general weighs heavily on men. Um, what do you think accounts for that? <laughs> well, rock music was always a, a male field. I mean, if you, uh, if you think about um, what people um, were, were presented with in the 1970s in terms of role models, there were very few women who there were front women, but there weren't very many women instrumentalists. And uh, so I think it, it was just part of that same tradition of, uh, of male dominated rock and roll. So very reflective, actually reflective, even in 2021 of a kind of, um, uh, uh, a, kind of a, a reflection of the people, the participants. Um, anybody else have any ideas in, in terms of that, that idea? Well, it was a boys club, like most cultural movements, you know, throughout throughout history, unfortunately. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, the men that I knew at that time were um, fellow musicians and they were very supportive and very um, enthusiastic. And, and, but, you know, I mean, it, it, still, it still was a struggle, of course, to, to find one's voice, to claim one's voice. I mean, that hasn't changed much either. So it was a real struggle and it took a lot of courage. And um, um, we, we, we persevered, we persisted. We continue. Mm -hmm. Heather, your portrait was one, was include, uh, a part of the exhibition, but it was among five portraits that didn't make the final cut due to uh, considerations around wall space and how all the portraits work together. That was an artistic prerogative decision. Um, so yours was on the cutting room floor along with Nardwars and his Dish Rags album. Um, what do you think of that decision? Since we're talking about kind of the um, uh, how women have been overlooked, that that you are yeah. not there, how did you feel about that? Oh, I didn't know I was going to be asked this. <laughs> I wasn't happy. No, I was. I did not like being excluded. Uh, the, the Vancouver scene was inclusive, even though it was male dominated. It was very inclusive, and uh, so yeah, I, 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 that didn't sit right with me. I didn't. Uh, I didn't understand. Uh, yeah, I, I was one of the very few. Uh, photographs, so I, I don't know, uh, but I'm not the curator. I, I, I didn't, I, I don't have any control over those decisions, but uh, yeah. There are things that died that we're un, unaware of, but um, we, there, are, there are elements that we're unaware of as to what would guide the selection, but you felt kind yeah. of- Yeah, I mean, I have, I, mean, I, I really can't say anything about it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, and, and- But I wasn't surprised either, really, you know, I don't know. It's like, I, I wasn't happy. Jade, how did you feel that, Nar I mean, Nardwar is a significant figure as well, holding up the Dish Rags album, obviously for a point uh, that his is not involved as well. How do you feel about that? 
Oh, I, I love Nardwar and I love the fact he's holding the Dish Rags album. Yeah, <laughs> no. I actually, I hadn't seen that until just now. So yes, um, a <laughs> yeah. shout out to Nardwar. <laughs> Yay, yeah. Nardwar, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, it's interesting, Heather, your partner is Doug Donut from the band Death Sentence, who figures quite large in the exhibition. Um, do you ever get into like territorial battles over who's punk? I mean, after all, if we're talking original, you preceded his band. Do you ever get into like uh, brawls or debates, fiery debates over who's more punk? No, <laughs> no, we're both we're both really uh, you know uh, just happy to be together and that uh, we survived. <laughs> yes. No, we, we we reminisce and 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 sometimes we gossip, but uh, no, we have a we're we're just um, we're really happy and grateful to be here. You know, many of our peers are not sadly, but no, it was um, a great time in our lives and we 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 do have that to share. I do find it so interesting that your partner's with Doug and that uh, <laughs> Jade, your partner, uh, Bill, played in the Point and Sticks, who is a very a celebrated um, in the history of punk rock, um, you know, immortalized in, in the um, cult movie Out of the Blue by Dennis Hopper, 1980. You two are together. So like punk, you <laughs> know, in love and politics. Um, how do you feel about that, that, that sort of tendency to overlook women? I mean, you're a, a progenitor, if not, you know, you were very, very early. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, Jade, how do you feel that, that I, uh, what goes on there? <laughs> Is it just the boys club that you referred to earlier? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the questions. Here. <laughs> you, you started out by talking about our partners. And yeah, and love and punk. I mean, I, I think that's cool that yeah. that you're that you're it makes sense that you would be, um, you know, partners with people from that particular time. But I mean, Bill's band pointed sticks. They're really I hear about them all the time. You know, when when we look at history of punk and yet with the dish rags, I mean, I hear about you more often now in retrospect, but, the, you know, I, I feel lesser so. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. No, I think um, it was because the Point and Sticks had quite a lot of success at the time and, uh, and they're still actually an, an active band now. So um, that does make some sense to me, but at the time, I mean, there were, there were hardly any women involved in the scene then. So just looking at the proportion of, of women to men, um, mm -hmm. but also, you know that being being a, a woman in in rock at that time it was definitely a double-edged sword so we got more attention a lot of the time because we were an all-girl band but also because we were 15 and 16 when we started too so i think just there was the youth factor there also um but i i'm really really glad now that when i ask my kids who are young adults about you know who their favorite female musicians are and they think it's just a stupid question <laughs> because they said well that's just like being asked who who are my favorite musicians it doesn't make any difference so i it's like to see that issue. kind of leveling of the playing field going on now so right. i'd like to think that we were there at the beginning of that and that punk i think did make a difference and that it was the kind of diy attitude that allowed a lot of women into the scene so you could get on stage and not be thinking about your technical prowess. You know, it wasn't, that wasn't what it was about. It was about musicality and, um, and, and attitude. So I think that, that that just sort of opened the boxes for women to enter in and become part of the scene. Yeah, it's, we're thankful for the, for the women that made a difference um, to change things with time. Um, it was a real backlash against romantic love back then. Um, you know, everyone eschewed that sort of thing. And of course they were making it out in the, in the corner of, in the back of the club, but you know, everyone acted as if they didn't care because <laughs> you weren't, you know, well, Dishwags wrote a song, I hate love or love, love sucks. I mean, that was, that was a very common. And of course, because we wanted to put our emphasis on our musicality and our involvement in, in our art. So, uh, so it was, it was in, just interesting that, uh, that, 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 that was a, a really strong um, ethic back then, you know, and that people, but, but of course, people still, still got together, <laughs> no matter what. I think yeah. Vanessa's had her hand up for a long time. Yeah, Vanessa, <laughs> um, oh, you have your hand up emoji. Um, yeah, getting to you as well. I mean, um, you like, wanted to dispel that notion of misogyny and introduce your, uh, to talk about uh, the things that you value and celebrate. Um, 
what are your thoughts here? I mean, yeah. originally when we invited you to be part of the panel, you weren't sure if you were, we were questioning your involvement. Um, what was that about? Uh, thank you for the question, Suki. And I'm gonna circle back first to some of the earlier um, points. I just want to also hail that there were guitar players in this city, many women who also played guitar like Connie, like Phaedra Stress and Bolero Lava, but also that the women of rock and roll, like women help seed rock and roll like Big Mama Thornton and Elizabeth Cotton. And one of the reasons why I started my um, contribution to this conversation today, hailing all those women is that I find it my responsibility to make the space when we're not being named to name us when we're there. And I wanna circle back to the issue of not having enough wall space to put a woman in a show about punk rock and invite us for a conversation afterwards as a gesture, which I appreciate. But I think this is what's being asked of us right now in 22nd century, 21st century and the 22nd year of it is what equity looks like in action. And that's when you notice something like, hey, there's no women in this show. That's when you get into a conversation with the curator, with the exhibitor, with the artist. And I think you make some kind of concerted and transparent conversation around that. I think the same goes for when you're representing women, when you're representing people who have been marginalized by white dominant culture, we actually have a lot of responsibility and, and capacity to shift it. I don't think it's fair to say there just wasn't, it was not enough room for you. Like that's, that's so colonial, so old school, so not rock and roll, so not punk rock. So I really just want to put that out there that we actually have a lot more agency. We have as much agency now as we did when we were 17 year olds just getting in there, kicking out the jam. So I, I wanted to say that most clearly. And um, in terms of my own contribution to uh, the question that you asked me, mm. I would like to say that punk rock changed my life. It wasn't a music style that I adapted or an aesthetic that I took on, but the politics of punk rock. When I met DOA as a kid in Burnaby at Burnaby Central and I went to Deer Lake and they did Rock Against Racism, it was the first time I heard about South Africa. I didn't know anything about apartheid. And so I was like, hold on a minute. There's a way that you can like be with these cool kids, learn politics, be in action. And there, like, I don't know how it was for you in high school, but I wasn't loving all the conversations, but the conversations happening in punk rock and through the zines and when we were sitting together I was like this these are my people and so that's what brought me into the fold and that's what also gave me the confidence out of high school to start a group with my friends and so in that way I do absolutely consider myself part of a, a child of punk rock if you will and certainly the content of what uh, Bolero Lava was talking about what we were thinking about and the freedom we gave ourselves to mash up between funk and boogaloo and big drums and big band and some punk rock and just what it felt like to be free. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm so glad that you're part of this, Vanessa. Um, I, when I heard your, your question, because there's the notion of punk, as in the actual sound of punk, Bolero Lava wasn't necessarily punk, but it was the spirit and the politic. And um, we were second gen, you know, by the time we came up in the 80s, it, 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 the, you had already laid the groundwork, mm -hmm. uh, Jade and Heather. Um, and so, uh, but I, at the same time, you were one of a, a handful of people, uh, people of color in our scene. Um, and you also a pioneer in LGBTQ queer celebration, um, real celebration, dancing so many times to your band. Uh, Bolero Lava. So very happy to have you here. Um, Thank I you. I appreciate you acknowledging also like Phaedra was one of the first queer people I saw uh, in some of the other circles. I know like the the whole interesting intersection between um, folk feminists like the fem like uh, the Holly Nears and like folk folk music had a lot of queer women in it. And that sort of like Carolyn, my friend Carolyn Bell from the Folk Time too, how they intermeshed and influenced young women in punk rock too. And then, but it was a pretty heterosexual scene. Um, and I, I always felt quite um, that it's a significant contribution that Bolero Lava made and how out Phaedra was. For sure. Very sexy, very hot, very exciting. It was like, what is the band up to? You were like the Archie's of the underground. Um, so I, I want to, before we continue on, um, see you in action, go back in time to then and uh, continue the, the conversation. So this is a little montage of all of us.
and awesome is that what is that like for you to see footage of yourself from then oh well we didn't even have well we had a video but it's lost now or I can't even find it it's 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 a uh, spooky <laughs> but fun yeah ghosts long time ago many lifetimes ago wow so Heather you like spooky ghosts <laughs> A haunted. So one of my former selves, you know, just one of my many former selves. So it's fun. Yeah. Um, kick, Bill? kick ass. It's great. We all kick ass. It's really great. Kick ass. Really exciting. I love seeing the original footage because it was such a small scene in those days that yeah. most of the audience members, I recognize everyone. So. Yeah. And they're all in other bands. And they're all, yeah. Like, yeah. It was a big happy family then. Yeah. It definitely was. Um, definitely was. It was tiny, but. Yeah, I was saying earlier, we had to stick together, you know? Yeah. It was a pretty dangerous time. That's an interesting thing. Because mm -hmm. we spoke on the CBC morning show the other day, and you you mentioned that as well, the danger of the time. Can you mm -hmm. elaborate on that? Well, you know, these days, I mean, piercings and tattoos are mainstream. Um, but back then, uh, as I said, you know, if you were wearing... Uh, and it's not a costume. I keep saying that because it, it, it was just it was it was to make a statement. But uh, anyone wearing anything like you know a leather jacket or, or shorn hair, I mean, they were definitely a target. And uh, it was it you know you you would get uh, greasers, bikers, yahoos from the burbs would come to shows at the Buddha and you know beat the crap out of people or on the street and throw bottles at you and. Uh, people would smash microphones into your face when you're trying to sing, you know, mm. and, uh, and hurl beer bottles at you. It was really insane uh, often. And the VPD, you know, routinely come into the club and, and smash people's heads against the walls and drag them off to jail and keep them overnight for, you know, in a drunk tank for no reason. So uh, as I said earlier, it just, it just was a really hairy time. It was an exciting time and uh, changed my life. Uh, it was something I really needed to happen to me. But um, yeah, it definitely required courage to, to, to be involved and to get involved. Absolutely. Vanessa, your thoughts when you see that footage? <laughs> Sorry, I was in chat land. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, I hear more how's, the chat, how's the chat going? It's interesting. Yeah. It's really interesting. And um, yeah, I just wanted to pull, uh, I was looking for the link to, to Connie's article that she did in Geist. I think it was called mm -hmm. Strange. Women. And she talks all about that period as well, too, and, uh, and some amazing writing about women in music and the show that she used to run on uh, Ruby Music. How do I feel about looking at it? Well, um, similar to, to Heather, I feel like it was a many lifetimes ago, and I feel, I feel like it was a foundational experience for me about what is possible and what it is when we collaborate together and what it is to create um, a life under your own um, 
agency, what it feels like to, to build a system. Thinking also like, remember like we had to, I don't know how many of you had to like sneak across the border, rather you could go across the border, but you'd sneak back with your records. Um, it was internet, it was like, you know, you had to have this whole network of people in Radio Land and promoters and people like Janet Forsyth at the railway and the Savoy who booked us. So when I look at that, I see all of us and I see the efforts that it took for us to create culture. Wow. Um, when I look at the footage, I'm like, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's like a timeless style. Mm -hmm. Like what, what I'm struck by is in terms of just artistically and aesthetically, many bands emerging now mm -hmm. look and sound like you did. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet Heather says at the time, it was like anomalous. It was a oh, yeah. choice that put you in danger, very different. I remember when I was a kid growing up in Lynn Valley in North Vancouver, seeing the first punk and it was like, a very, a very starkly different from most everybody else. So you read, really had to stand alone. Um, but, and yet that music, and then like with Belair Lava, I'm, I think there, there's probably a lot of emerging bands from Montreal taking crib notes about <laughs> that look and style, that whole sound, that dance sound is like re reigniting again, like in terms of culture, it continues to, uh, it, it permeates. You don't look dated. You look like you could be bands from today. Jill, you're an art historian. Jade, uh, what do you think of that? Um, I just want to start by, by just mentioning, because the, you know, the Polygon show has come up a few times. I did want to say that there are actually women represented there. Heather, unfortunately, is not. But just so you know, it's not all men that are uh, in, in defense of the gallery. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, so the um, and sorry, Sukian, what was what was your question again? I'm, I'm not. Uh, yeah, yeah, my my feeling was that um, when I see the, the music, um, it's as if time collapses and you look like you all could be bands from today. Yeah. OK, so that actually another point that I, I wanted to draw in there. I'm really glad, Vanessa, you mentioned borders, because um, <laughs> while I think there is a lot of a lot of punk rock still and, you know, from the four bands there, you can still hear that sound. It's times have changed so much because an example of us sneaking across the border once involved. I had no ID. I forgot my ID when we got to the border. <laughs> And so our drummer scout quickly wrote me a note pretending that she was my mom. And I handed it to the border guard and they let us across the border with that. So there I think that gives a sense of historical perspective on, you know, the difference between then and now. So, but, um, but the, um, yeah, I mean, musically, I think it's very gratifying and I love a lot of current bands because, well, like I, you know, that was my first love was well after I was really into sort of glam rock because it also I thought introduced a kind of sense of rebellion and things and it, it nicely then sort of dovetailed into the the punk scene but uh but yeah no I think it's I think it's it's great that that still sounds maybe not quality wise like with the Shrags clip I think would sound a lot better if it was yeah. if it was recorded now but uh but yeah in terms of the sound it's, it's it was too. definitely primitive yeah <laughs> or, or the, the tools that we had then I, th I think it sounds great I, I wouldn't change a thing. It's it's <laughs> brilliant stuff. All of your bands are decidedly all female. Um, what were some of the things that went into shaping your direction, your sound, and your style? Again, um, you mentioned Montreal, so I want to call out the band Demi Monde. I don't know if any of you ever saw them play at the Savoy or maybe played with them or visited them in Montreal. And while we're in Montreal, and speaking of style, I want to call the name of Gigi Duval. I think that might have been the first time I had somebody make clothes that was somebody that I knew. And um, she did she did this really kind of deconstructed, big stitched, mashed up, hand painted, loose and beautiful um, matching ensembles that I really appreciated. <laughs> Anybody else remember Gigi Duval out there? Uh, I'm not familiar, but I've definitely heard that. Yeah, Fuller Lava, super stylish. I mean, I think <laughs> members of your band worked in like independent clothing designer shops. Uh, really, really, um, really gr great sense of um, uh, style and fashion and, and content. And then also with Heather and Jade, just like I'm looking at it and it just feels really, really uh cutting edge and, and brilliant. I mean, what were some of your influences as, as progenitors of this music and look and scene? What were some of your inspirations and influences? 
Well, I mean, I, I grew up uh, listening to my mother's music and uh, I'm a small town BC girl. And, and uh, so I was country music, you know, and, and, and folk music. I sang in choirs every chance I got. My family moved every couple of years and I'd, I'd go to the church just so that I could sing in the choir because I love to sing. And, um, but a lot of the music that we sang in school too then <clears throat> were, were old classic folk music standards, the, the kind that, you know, Peter, Paul and Mary sang. And <clears throat> so I, I, I learned harmony and I learned melody and, and, and learned to sing that way. But um, then as I, you know, when I became, entered puberty, my, the first record I ever bought was Jimi Hendrix, I experienced and I bought it at Keytel, I mean, at the Keymart, I remember. And uh, so rock and roll, of course, just uh, blew me away. And, and, uh, and I listened to Bowie. Bowie saved my life in high school, I swear. You know? and, uh, and then a bit later, I was introduced to, uh, you know, Lenny Lovett and the Slits. And um, uh, I mean, I love uh, the selector, Pauline Black and, and uh, the scummy, everything that British, you know, British rock, it was great. And that happened when I moved to Vancouver. I got introduced to a lot of that, that incredible music, uh, mostly female artists too, that, that like Chrissy Hind, oh my God, as a singer and a performer and a songwriter, it just incredible influence uh, on, on me and what I've done. So um, I just, I, I think that it, it, obviously, you know, it evolved. Um, but I, I, I mean, I was so inspired and I had to put, um, I had to do it. I mean, I was just a frustrated wannabe for so long. And so when I came to Vancouver and, and saw the dish tracks and saw the device, saw everyone around me and all my friends, um, I was completely swept up in it. And before I knew it, I was on stage singing songs that I had written with my band members. And it was all very exciting. And I couldn't even believe it was happening, you know, that I was finally doing this, claiming my voice. Yes. That's so super awesome. I, I loved um, Susie and the Banshees and Lena Love and oh, yeah. Hagen, and very inspired by the local community, so vibrant that I was fortunate to grow up with. Um, Jill, uh, what what were some of the qualities that uh, pushed you to form form this this new expression? Um, well. We came out of like the, the three original dish rags. We went to elementary and high school together. So we started out as a group of friends um, who were huge music fans. And so in high school, we like Heather, you know, David Bowie, I think saved our lives too. Um, <laughs> he credited was doing a lot of that. But we, you know, we loved Bowie and T Rex. And I think probably our female role model at that time was Susie Quattro because she was one of the few sort of kick-ass women artists at the time who actually played an instrument. Um, and so we were really into Susie Quattro. Um, and then I think it was, I, I, I used to read a music man, music magazines religiously. And, and uh, I, I think it was either Circus or Cream Magazine or one of those seventies music magazines that had a review of the Ramones album. And um, so it was the summer of 76, I went to Seattle with my parents and, uh, and picked up a copy of the first album. and. And that really, for us, like, there weren't, as, as I was aware, there weren't any women doing that kind of music then. And I think it's also important to remember for maybe the younger people in the audience that it was really hard to access music then. Like you had the radio, which played crap in those days. <laughs> and, and if you wanted to, to listen to music, you went and bought vinyl. There weren't that many places where you could buy vinyl, especially growing up in Victoria. Like there weren't, exactly. there wasn't a, a big indie scene there. So crossing the border was kind of essential going down to Seattle and, and um, the Vancouver punks were constantly crossing the border to go and buy singles down there. Right. So, uh, so yeah, and you know, if there were women making, making music like the Ramones or looking like the Ramones, we didn't know about them. <laughs> possible they were there but you know it was really hard to to access music then so but you know the Ramones really kind of set our style in terms of wow you know these these songs are made up of three chords they're made up of attitude these are guys who are are wearing things that we can afford to wear you know they've got torn jeans and t-shirts and and that you know I think that was one difference with us and and what's on at the polygon too is that you know we it, it actually costs a lot of money to buy like 
you know, biker jackets and things I was like black leather pants. Never afford and, a leather jacket. For yeah, sure. So, so we, I mean, we dressed, we dressed essentially like boys. Like we, we bought men's collar shirts and wore work boots and pants. And, and that was, you know, it was, it was really based, you know, the Ramones, I think, again, were a pretty big inspiration there. <laughs> Recycled, recontexted uh, cultural <laughs> artifacts. Uh, in my gen, a lot of uh, feminists are making their own stuff. You know, DIY, you just take something, you write all over it, you yeah. bust it out. <laughs> very, very good style. Um, I would say also, in terms of finding the music, I really appreciated uh, Brave New Waves. That made a huge difference. And what CITR was doing and is still doing for breaking new artists. Yeah. Also, I wanted to say earlier around the influence piece, what I uh, sort of hearkening back to this actually adjacent relationship between folk music and punk rock, thinking about Billy Bragg and through Billy Bragg, hearing more yeah. about Pete Seeger and realizing that I'd been raised on Pete Seeger songs in elementary school, and then mm -hmm. keeping this abiding interest in this work and then discovering his political work and how he'd been blacklisted and therefore went into the universities to share his music, where women were going to be trained as elementary school teachers. So that you had this legion of women teaching young kids in elementary school, radical social change music. And that is certainly one of the things that took me to being a choir leader for the Woodward's Community Singers, later called Van Van Song Society, for 11 years until COVID. And it was under this same, if you will, this combination of punk rock and folk mm -hmm. power where everybody has the opportunity to be music and to feel what it feels like. Yeah, that's the, for sure. That idea of inclusion, I mean, I was, a, I was raised um, in a very conservative and um, a lot of st very strict Chinese Canadian family. I ran away from home when I was 15 and was embraced by a queer community in Strathcona and a very vibrant art, art scene that basically said, do whatever you want. Like I was an atonal, I wasn't a very good singer. <laughs> It sounded terrible. It's great style. You have great style. You know, then, and they're just like, just go for it. Yeah. And you felt like you just went for it. You were just, we valued idiosyncrasy. People mm -hmm. loved, what do you got? What do you have to say? What are you expressing? That notion of cover bands? No, not really. Oh, God, yeah. I also appreciate um, going back, uh, Jade, um, your acknowledgement that there are some women involved in the OG Punk exhibition um, looking, I, I mean, if we do have to dissect it down into gender, there are 11, 11 men, four women, including trans women, Raven Slander. So yes, there, are, there is um, representation, but still the point that we, points we raised earlier are, are still key to this conversation. Um, I wanted to throw things over to Michael, who is from the Polygon, um, to ask Michael what, what interesting questions are arising from our very, uh, a very awesome panel of uh, people who have tuned into this. Now, there's so uh, many people. I've got two, I've got two here for you. Uh, the Thank first you. one is from Melody. And it was, uh, what was the impact of Expo 86 on the scene at the time? So, can you say that again, Michael? What was the impact of Expo 86 on the scene at the time? <laughs> That's funny. Not much. Not much. That, that, you're, okay, so you're, this is a, a sort of second gen convo. Valera Lava and my band BYU, we were in there, but it was, I, I remember, it was scandalous, scandalous. Okay, first uh, they sort of had a, uh, a, a stage for local, local talent, um, local bands specifically from our scene um, that encompassed many different genres, but I think Slow was one of the first bands to take that stage. And um, I think Tom and Tell me took his pants off and ran around. Yeah, he did. Um, free, free flow, free flow. And then it was like kind of kiboshed. That's my, my, my memory of it. Yeah, my, yeah. my memory of it was actually a lot of not dissimilar to the Olympics, there was a lot of activism around it. And we were concerned about what the impact would be on housing, what the impact would be on our rehearsal spaces. Cause you remember this is when Yale town started to be gentrified and that had an impact on our, on our cultural spaces. It was also, I remember I lived on Union Street right by Benny's. I lived on that street, I think for about nine years. And- um, I lived down the street from you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember when you would come over. And I remember we'd sit, we'd watch it, like we'd have our band rehearsal and we'd come out onto the middle of Union Street and watch the fireworks and be like, yeah, fuck you, Expo, fuck you, Expo. And then they invited us and we're like, Ooh, whoa, I don't know how we feel about this. And we talked about it for a long time. And what we decided in the end, and we knew that there was a lot of different thoughts about it, but we really felt that there was an opportunity to um, interject, intervene, and to represent ourselves in a stage where we weren't particularly welcomed, but mm -hmm. also that it was an opportunity to bring something that wasn't um, what our understanding of Expo was at the time. And these are young people in our early 20s making a political choice, but we took a lot of thought about it. And it had, as I mentioned earlier, the impact in terms of Vancouver reimagining itself as a resort town from primary industry into a resort town and selling itself to the world, it started to have a huge impact on, on our cultural spaces and our housing capacity. And I, I think that is a seminal time in, in a cultural history. Absolutely. I mean, back in the day, um, uh, there'd be disused um, industrial spaces like city space, where artists would just squat and put on stuff. And th that was part of, uh, it was affordable. Um, 80, Expo 86 sort of ushered in the next uh, generation of gentrification, as, as we all know, as soon as gentrification occurs, artists are pushed out. Um, exactly. Which is, which is uh, that, that, that timeless conversation. Um, Michael, are there any other questions that you'd like to raise yeah, I have uh, one from, uh, apologies if I mispronounce this name, Zuleika. What advice would you give to someone like me who is not either a man or woman, but must navigate many spaces, often queer and or punk spaces, assumed to be by and for often white men? Mm. Mm -hmm. Courage, my love. Courage, my love. Courage. <laughs> keep on keeping on. You're in a strong tradition of people who can break molds and break walls down and just take good care of yourself. And um, don't think too much. Stay in your body and exactly how it feels. Make sure you're breathing well. Make sure you notice when you feel good. Make sure you notice if you want to leave the room. Make sure you notice when something is coming up and you want to speak it and you're silencing yourself. Take your time, take a breath and say what you need. Do you. Do you and flourish. Yeah. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't, you said it so well, Vanessa. It's, it's, that's so vital and so true. I mean, it, uh, I mean, I, I can't help but persist. I mean, being true to oneself, I mean, it, it's, it, it's in you to do, to be an artist and to express. I think all of us are artists or, and unfortunately, sadly, so many of us are, are, it's beaten out of us, literally a lot of people from a young age, you know, uh, no, you have to get a real job. You have to, you know, you have to get with the program, all that crap. But if that's, you know, it, it will, it will surface. You know, your your need to express yourself is is just it cannot be. Um, it's just gonna, it's going to surface no matter what. You know, it just be true to yourself and and claim that voice. I find it hurts mm -hmm. not to be yourself. Oh well, yeah, exactly. Press. That stuff. So much pain. So much pain. Not being be able to do that to express. Constantly, I, I'm a blurter, and maybe I should shut up sometimes. <laughs> um, no, I, please don't stop. Yeah, I I think I, I have a, a guileless quality. Sometimes I, I tend to run off the edge and not realize, and then afterwards I'm like, oh, what did I do? <laughs> so I would say just like try to try to yeah, be be you. Yeah, do you just do you? Says. I mean, in terms of your own sh experiences that dovetail to this question, um, earlier we were speaking about some of the obstacles facing um, women feminists in the early punk scene. Um, Jill, Jade, and Heather, could you tell me about instances where you combated um, uh, sexism and misogyny, specific ways in which you countered that? Um, well, as I said earlier, persist. I, um, I, I moved to Los Angeles and, and, and pers to pursue a career. And uh, when I went, I had no doubt that I was going to be a rock star. <laughs> That's how naive I was. And uh, as you said, guileless and, and, uh, and but you know that's the youth. Uh, that's the folly of youth. That's the hubris of youth, which is which is great. It's a it's a wonderful engine, and I wouldn't be who I am without having had that experience. But I did encounter so much. Um, <clears throat> I mean, things like, uh, well, you know, you'd get this line like, "Well, we can't play more than one." 
female artist and now in terms of radio airplay and stuff like that you know people would say that to me like well we've got enough female singer songwriters in our roster and that sort of thing and oh my god like what am I going to do about that a and R guys would say, "Oh yeah, I'm coming to see your show," and then they'd show up and they'd hide at the back of the room. And then you'd—I realized after a while they have absolutely no power whatsoever. In fact, you know, if but they act like they do, they pretend they do, and uh, and use it to you know, obviously exploit that supposed power. And um, so that would be so frustrating. You get your hopes up and think, "Oh, get all excited and think, oh yeah, because I had this singular goal." I just wanted to get uh, signed to a major label, uh, record label. And I thought I had was certain that would happen. But um, um, just those kinds of things. And in order to, I mean, somehow I managed to just persist. And then when, when that dream died, I, I, uh, I had to reassemble and regroup and, and, and realize that just because that didn't happen, it doesn't mean I'm no longer an artist or who I am. Sure. Um, but you know, it's it it was it was really it was really frustrating, really hard, and uh, and in order to, and I still managed to come out of it the other end and 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 continue to create, to be a creator, and continue to express myself. And so, it sounds uh, like there's a kind of an innate letting go. Exactly. I mean, you know, the, you have to. Yeah, and it takes. It's painful, and it it takes it takes time to readjust and everything, but. Um, I don't know, I said, I, it just, uh, it, it wasn't, uh, I managed to persist and to, and to carry on uh, despite, a, you know, a certain, um, certain, certain frustrations and, and struggles. It's life is struggle. <laughs> Jade Blade, what about you? How did you um, combat moments where you encountered sexism in the scene? I think we combated sexism in the scene just by being there. I mean, it um, infiltrating, I think, uh, persistence, um, not taking any guff from anyone, although there was a lot of guff. <laughs> but, uh, but I will say that the punk scene was much more supportive than the, the general uh, rock and roll scene out there. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I mean, I'm, I would classify myself as a total introvert. And most of the time I was on stage, I was trying to disappear, which is why I would often wear like five men's shirts when I was on stage <laughs> because I didn't want to be noticed. But I also at the same time was aware that just being present and um, as asserting the, the sort of equality of our, what we had to contribute um, was, was as political and, you know, I guess, in terms of, of our, um, our costume as well. Like just, um, we would be sure to present ourselves in ways that, uh, you know, I guess with the, the boys clothing and, and um, not wanting to conform to the sort of boxes of femininity that were typically um, presented to people and and you know I think I sort of think of punk rock as in a way kind of like the history of pants <laughs> but it, you know it's said that it took the a world war for women to be able to wear pants in <laughs> in general and, and in the 1970s it was still women in pants were sometimes turned away from restaurants and it, again to get give a sense of the time too um so that what we were what we were wearing, I think, really made a pretty strong statement at that time as well. And it tended to attract a lot of attention. So people would be looking at us in the street. And um, uh, we were often sort of confronted by people who didn't understand where we were coming from. But, um, but clearly what we were doing was making a difference in some small way, I think, at that time. I would imagine it would feel on the other hand, in terms of um, there is the kind of dangerous side, but to stand alone and to stand strikingly indifference to the norm would be empowering. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, uh, it it always felt good, actually. You know, when yeah. uh, when yeah. when you would, and and that's something that I think is is a much harder thing to do now. I think um, it's. It was because times were so intensely conservative, it was pretty easy to stir things up and radicalize things like clothing. Yeah. <laughs> and Vanessa, um, 
what enabled you to take up space in your work? Um, what, what allowed you to do that? You know, you, you... That's a big question. Um, and it's what I, what I can say, I'd, I'd like to speak a little bit to um, a question that's in the chat. And I think I can touch a little bit on what you're asking, Sakian, and some of it was the experience, so in, as a child growing up, my experience of music and black culture in my family home was like funk music, soul music, Trinidadian music, Caribbean music, the old Cosmos Club in North Van. And when ska happened, that was the first time I saw young black people making music. I was like, oh, and again, there was this relationship between the politics of ska music and the conversations they were having about the, the Thatcher years and it had this relationship both to punk, to politics, and to my own Caribbean culture. And I was like, oh my God, where's a two-tone sweater? Somebody, I was like, car, you know, look in every store, give me some of that black and white. I couldn't believe it. It was like so um, elating. And it felt like an opportunity and an inroad because here was something you could dance to while being mad as hell. <laughs> and I really appreciated that. And um, there was a question in the chat that Sandra Seekins asked about the relationship between the visual arts culture around Brain Eater and the young romantics. And um, I'm thinking of Graham and Angela and um, Derek. And so what, what I thought was so interesting about that time and again has stayed as an imprint on me as a way to be in the world as a possibility is the opportunity for collectivism, for collaboration between forms when you're exploring an idea. And I think what we found between the art forms is that many of us were thinking some different ideas, but complementary ideas. And so if there was an opportunity, if there was an art exhibit, then a band would play that was in relationship to that artist or to that idea, to that theme. And um, in my own experience, when I, when I, I left Vancouver in January, 1992, and I went to the UK for 12 years. And part of what I was interested in was an opportunity to do even a deeper collaboration across genres and forms. And at the time, it wasn't so common for, in the circle that I was in around, uh, particularly hip hop and poetry spoken word, to start mashing everything all up together. But I took that Vancouver experience with me. I took that kind of West Coast confidence and like, let's just do it and let's all try together. And yeah. they, like, well, mate, well, wait, well, it wasn't very popular, but it worked like pretty good. And then eventually it was so much fun. Everybody wanted to give it a try. I'm not saying we were the first, but it was like, it was a big deal to try collaboration between these forms in the particular place where I had landed. And I, I account that experience and confidence from my, from actually literally going here under the guidance of the sisters. Hey, be bold, be for peace. Yeah, for sure. There was a cross pollination of the time that we came up in poets mm -hmm. and dancers and musicians all hybridizing and it just it seemed very like the epicenter of the world was where we were. Um, there was one person that I really wanted to include in the conversation and that is Gene Smith of the band Mecha Normal. A uh, huge inspiration to me has gone on to um, have a very vibrant career. Uh, Mecha Normal along with David Lester. I wanted to ask um, uh, a Jean about her experiences in terms of uh, the early underground scene in um, 1983, so she'd be second gen. Um, she's uh, considered uh, to be the purveyor of the, of the riot girl scene uh, who went on to um, influence bands like uh, Bikini Kill and, and Kathleen Hanna. I found it interesting and may I share some of um, what, what Jean shared with me? Okay, so she wrote, our first show was opening for DOA at the Smiling Buddha in 1984 and the audience pretty much ignored us, which was to be expected. Our format of two people and my feminist lyrics were a reaction to a scene with very few women on stage. We didn't really find a community in Vancouver. Having said that, both Joe and Wimpy from DOA were big inspirations to me as a lyricist and performer. David's brother, Ken, was DOA's manager in the mid eighties. So we were on the list for a lot of good shows. <laughs> there was definitely tension during our sets when they opened for Fugazi in Vancouver, someone threw a shoe at Dave. So as I said, um, Jean uh, and Dave, in terms of uh, their trajectory, they had to um, find their community by getting out of Vancouver and touring. She said that a gig at an anarchist cafe in Montreal blew their minds. 
And when they toured the West Coast, they were able to finally find a home on K Records in Olympia, Washington, and went on to inspire a new generation of feminists. Um, so I, 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 found, I found that interesting that, um, Vanessa, you left, you took what you learned here, you went to the UK, there's Jean, a whole other story, you mm -hmm. know, going further afield. Uh, I had a, a wonderful time in Vancouver at that time. It, it's, it certainly guides me, my principles and my worldview and my creation. And then it's hearing some of the more difficult experiences from, mm -hmm. from um, Heather and Jade, um, mm -hmm. and yet perseverance to continue and the excitement of that time. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, I'd like to turn things over to you again. Do you find, uh, do you have any good questions for us? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, yes, from D here. How can younger women musicians, all artists really, survive and thrive with the cost of living in Canadian cities now, especially Vancouver? Uh, I played music in the 80s, but wonder about the future of real protest and creative music. Mm. I'd love to address that. Mm. Um, and it's not going to be suitable for everybody. Um, and every artist makes their choice to how they want to live. And... Oh, this little quote is coming to me and I'm not remembering it. It's the Spanish poet. And he said, I used to try and find the right words for the poem. And now I just want to be the poem. Mm -hmm. Myself, I take my practice of being an artist to realms outside of the arts because the arts is a false economy. It has no dignity and there's no space between star and starving. And it's not, we're not currently in a culture that actually cultivates a healthy relationship to, to, to the arts or artists. We have a celebrity culture that counts on popularity, which is not the same as some other cultures that are more historic and have a way um, of caring for all in their society, the lands we're on as an example. But what I have found to be very useful is currently I'm working as an instructor at Simon Fraser University in their community capacity building certificate program, as well as collaborating with an organization called Hollyhock for the Social Venture Institute. And these are um, businesses that are in the business of making the world work better. So how are the, what are the kinds of businesses that are not harming the world that are triple bottom line? Maybe they're a B Corp, maybe they're an, um, a cooperative or a not-for-profit or a for-profit that's just doing something smarter and better for the planet. I'm interested in artists being at every table in every situation, not only for the quality of our thinking and um, excuse me, not just for the contribution of our aesthetics or the kind of material culture we produce, but really for the quality of our thinking. And so for myself, I have found it very helpful and brought more dignity and bankroll to my life when I took myself out of trying to get grants and started hustling, making my own work, making my, and so, so there was a definitely a period, like a long period where I was a grant seeking person. And then I just started to take more of my interest to other areas for people where we're aligned with values and bringing my practices to a larger, again, much like the choir, much like Seeger, to who else wants to play with this? And finding myself inside of um, opportunities that respected my contribution, and it was very useful. And I've found it to be very rewarding. Jade? <laughs> oh boy, uh, that's such a, a tough question. And I, I do, I really, really feel for, for young mm -hmm. people in the arts in places like Vancouver. Um, when, uh, when, I mean, when, in the 70s, when we were um, trying to survive, you know, the three of us lived together in very small places, in some cases, you know, like rooming houses with a bathroom down the hall. And there's all of that idea of suffering for arts, which is, is not a good reality. It's not something that people should need to do. And I think we need to advocate as much as possible for, for better funding for artists. And um, it, the arts are always underfunded um, overburdened and it, you know now with COVID it's just been absolutely devastating to uh, the arts communities and um, so going forward I don't know I mean I, I, I can't there are obviously no simple solutions because it's a complex set of problems that leads to this with real estate values etc but uh, mm -hmm. but you know I, I I'm, I'm a firm believer in now that I've got a job and I'm comfortable I'm a firm believer in being sort of a happy taxpayer as long as our taxes are going to things that I do support. I, I, you know, 
I think we need to get away from that sort of American um, sense of, of being um, outraged when we have to pay taxes for things because that's kind of one of the few ways in which communities can be supported. Um, and also, you know, for anyone who is able to contribute above and beyond, you know, paying taxes is like support your arts communities and, and um, try to get as much funding out there. Go, go see shows, buy tickets to things, donate. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's not a direct answer to your question. And, you know, it, it, it brings in some elements too. Um, and Heather, how do you feel about this question? Um, <laughs> I, I have no solution. It's, I, I'm myself just so um, overwhelmed by the 21st century and what's uh, the reality of, and my son's 27 and uh, he he's managed, he's doing well, he's managed to uh, carve out a niche and he's monetized his YouTube channel. He, you know, he's an influencer, he's got half a million subscribers. He's really smart and he's done that. But I know that that's not an option for most people his age. And I feel so badly for people um, young people his age and, and oh my god like yeah they can't even find rentals I mean it's just so much harder than yeah. when I was his age and I just uh, I, I don't know I mean I, I myself just survived by being self-employed and having enough and being able to carve out enough time to, to to write when I can in between gigs it's a gig economy now and I've adjusted to that and uh, but it's certainly not ideal, and I get so frustrated with living in a capitalist society. I always have, but I mean, it's just the, the disparity has become even worse and, and harder to navigate than ever before. And I just don't. I feel so sorry for, um, as I said, the young, the young, <laughs> the kids that are coming up. I mean, it's just really, really dismaying. And I wish I had uh, an answer. All I all I know is that. Um, I don't know, self-employed, start your own, your own gig or your own business. I mean, that's what I've been able to do, but I, I know that that's not always um, feasible either. And I just, I'm sorry, but I, I don't really- All of us are very fortunate to have come up in the time that we did. We're, you know, um, Jay, you're uh, a prof. Vanessa, you're doing all of your, your multidisciplinary practice. Um, you're able to keep afloat Heather, um, with your career as a, as a poet and writer, but it well, is so hard for many people trying to pave a path today and survive capitalism. Um, the can I, digital, I, I, got, I have something solution based for this as well, and, and it's about it's culture. Be, I, I have I have a feeling, Vanessa, you you would probably have some some ideas around solution making because it, it it ought not be so forlorn, but there are real real factors, the modern digital age that, that um, uh, hard to make a living selling stuff when everything's for free, everything that's digital, um, unless you're an artist with an artifact that you can sell. Um, you know, now there's NFTs, but those are problematic in terms of ec ecological destruction. Um, it, it is a big messy thing and maybe yeah. just acknowledging the mess and seeing what we can do. I mean, I'm looking at somebody like Gene Smith, who is like, not only contributed hugely to culture um, and it had very lean years. During the pandemic, she decided to reinvent herself in a new way and that was to paint pictures. And she's kind of sticking it to sort of the economics by each of the paintings and portraits are $100. Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of um, a kind of uh, formal constraint to the paintings. And she sold over 1,500 of them and she's making an, a free art residency for the future, um, bringing, going to be inviting people and a great success. There was a huge spread on Jean in the New York Times um, just last year. So, you know, taking that innovative spirit of which you have as an artist and applying it, finding, as Vanessa says, you took your brain that you grew from these experiences and applied it in different fields. Um, mm -hmm. Vanessa, do you have any more um, insight as to... Um, yeah, I do, thank you. Um, it's just my opinion, um, which I'm quite fond of. Um, <laughs> I think it's an opportunity. If we take responsibility for our political systems and our capacity to change and shape culture, that we also, a couple of things, two things, as to Jade's point, to Jill's point, Jill Jade, Jade Jill, um, <laughs> the taxpayers 
So holding our, our politicians and our policymakers accountable to the role of the arts in our common culture and the role it plays in education, early education. I think part of the reason that people have so much heartbreak is that we have a practice of making art, of being music, of being the dance, and there's only one role. You either are an, uh, an, a dabbler, an amateur, which is socially frowned upon, or you're a professional. And you're not a real artist unless you're a professional and you're asking your arts practice to buy you dinner. You could actually pursue so many other things that also light your, light your heart, make you wanna sing and have an arts practice without having to turn to a public to support it necessarily. I know that's not appropriate for all forms and everybody wants to share the thing that they've made and crafted. But I feel that there's a, in my work with many hundreds and hundreds of young people, I always ask them, do you wanna be a poet or do you wanna be a star? Do you wanna be an influencer? Do you want to like have your face up on shit or do you want to actually say something and have uh, many routes to how to lift your voice? And I think what's happened in contemporary culture is that we associate a successful artist with a celebrity. And I think part of our responsibility for ourselves and for the future of young artists is that we make sure our culture makes arts accessible to every person so that everybody has a satisfaction and we don't be like, oh, I've got a lousy life with some work I don't like. I'm so in love with this experience of making art. And the only way to be with it in integrity in my culture is somehow to make it pay for my life. And I think that there's actually more options. Oh, sure there are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there has to be. <laughs> Anyone else have any thoughts to add to that, that uh, notion? Mm -hmm. Not really. Um, okay, well, let's move on again. Michael, do you have any more questions for us? No, you can move on. Okay, um, so I, I, um, I'm wondering, you know, what is one quality that you developed in your formative years, your, your early years making art and music in the Victoria and Vancouver scenes that you retain today and inform your current practice? <laughs> Always question authority. I think, <laughs> it, you know, that's something everyone should always do. Um, and um, yeah, that's it, nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and now we have online, you know, and so many people asserting um, expert opinions, how to wade through that, how to wade through what we are disseminating and, and taking in online. Because many, there are many, quote unquote, quote, you know, truth tellers, uh, but you have to wonder where they're coming from. But at the same time, kind of not be, when you, if you're over questioning, it can get into a neurotic trap as well, but how, to, you know, navigating that, that, that field. So question authority, question what you see, question how you feel yourself, create space to find, find out how you feel. That's always hard. Heather, what is something you retained from those early years, it continues to inform your practice. Well, I would just say uh, stamina, <laughs> persistence. I, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I learned uh, to 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 never, yeah, give in or give up or, you know, I mean, uh, and and I always felt like I was shouting into a void. I and mean, certainly I can still feel that way all, as most artists do. I mean, we feel, well, often we isolate ourselves in order to create, but um, I um, just learned to, to trust in the process and, and, and believe in my own um, ability to, to, to create and, 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 and claim my voice and my, vo my process. And it's so sort of second nature now. I don't even, I mean, I don't think, I don't certainly don't question it and I am true to it and I employ it pretty much every day. And I do try to live by the edict of, you know, my life is my art, my art is my life. And uh, I mean, that's pretty much, <clears throat> that is my, my, uh, my uh, priority. And, and I try my best <laughs> to live according to that, to, to, to that, to that, it's, it's a need, you know, I can't, I can't live without my art and, and my, and the process, as I said, it's just become, Second nature, it's, it is my life. And, and so it did start then, that was the catalyst, you know, being surrounded by that, that, that spirit and passion um, for music and for art 
that was the catalyst for me and I'm very grateful for it. And it's definitely propelled me forward and, ma and still maintains uh, who I am as an artist. It's really wonderful to hear that, you know, uh, hear, hear about, you know, as a, as a young person flooded with uncertainty, mm -hmm. uh, you know, can you take up space? Can you do that? Uh, now, now that now you, it, that it becomes second nature to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was so insecure and uh, so suffered a, a severe, you know, inferiority complex, probably still do, but. but I did that, too. I still yeah. do. Oh, yeah. Well, well, I'm wondering like, how do you do it? How do you? You know, you're intelligent. You question everything, including yourself. You know, yes. you need to. So, so that's part of it too. What but, do you think was the key for you to be able to come to a place today where it's self, um, second nature, to not not go down that route of self uh, insecurity? Um, well, I mean, I, I am still questioning all the time and, and doubting myself, but um, I don't know. Somehow, I've I've managed to uh, create, uh, you know. I even resort to rituals sometimes when I need to, and and um, uh, I've I've managed to find my own process, and I think that all artists do, and all artists must, and 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 we are able. The only way we can uh, go forward and create and persist is 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 by um, you know latching onto that that process, and it's it, it is wonderful because every artist um, finds their own very unique way of. Of, of doing that, yeah. of being an artist, Absolutely. despite everything. <laughs> uh, Vanessa, what's a quality you developed formatively in that time place that, that still is a big part of your worldview? Keep good company. <laughs> Be good company, keep good company. Be careful of the company you keep. Be with people who lift you up, you know? Um, we shall be known by the company we keep by the ones who circle around to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. Boom. It is time now. It is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the world. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning. We shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. It's by the artists, my muse, two sisters. Nice. Good company. It, it is a time to be alive. Yeah. You know, this is at this juncture is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And for arts, you know, dissension, conflict, beauty, joy, kick up your heels. All of this is great for, for making stuff. We are reflectors yeah. of the times. That is our job, part of our job. And it is yeah. a wonderful time. Get to, um, to straddle the 20th and the 21st century. And it is an incredible time, wiggy and weird and strange, but. I've, I, I, that excites me and inspires me. Me too, totally. <laughs> um, on the flip side, um, what is one quality uh, that you developed during that time, the early formative years in Victoria and Vancouver, 70s and 80s, that you have outgrown and dropped? It's not, it's not needed anymore. <clears throat> what, is, what, is, uh, what is that? Who wants to wrestle <laughs> oh that one? Well, I think I've learned humility, you know, um, and especially now with the internet and all the trolls. And I mean, I, I try very hard uh, to <clears throat> limit my uh, uh, my exposure to it, uh, especially social media. Um, you know, the old opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. And uh, my opinion is <clears throat> no more. Uh, you know, it's just not, I don't feel the need to, I mean, I was a raging feminist, which was really important to me. And I had to go through that. It was really, I had to go through that, but uh, I don't need, feel the need to um, convince anybody of anything anymore. And there's a lot of freedom in that. I, I'm just so much more <laughs> at ease in the world because I don't, I'm not here to, uh, I know that I can't change the world, but I, I do, I can change, the only control I have is my response to it. 
And back then I was, you know, I, I just, again, I was speaking earlier of the folly of youth and naivety of youth and, and uh, it propelled me that anger. And I'm really grateful for that, I, that, that had to happen. But I um, just have a much different uh, stance, a better stance, a better uh, feeling about being in the world. Um, it's just perspective. Uh, it's an informed perspective and I'm grateful for it. That's really great. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of you can't change the world, but you can room the, leave the room with a bit of dignity. <laughs> exactly. Um, Jill, what about you? What's a, what's a quality that you, you've dropped along the way? <laughs> Well, I agree with a lot of what Heather just said, but I think the other thing is um, is fear. Um, I used to be, well, I think in the uh, the videos you get the sense of of us being on stage and constantly feeling like we were being surveilled, and and we felt that being up there was important because our presence was important because we didn't have women to see on stage at that time, at least not, you know, when we first started out. And, um, but I think if I were to do it all again, as I am now, I would be much less afraid, I would have been a different kind of persona on stage. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, as a teenager, often you end up with um, feeling kind of more paranoid about the world. And I think as you make your way through the world, you tend to come to understand it more. And I think a lot of that does come through that, that sort of increased sense of kind of criticality and just wrapping your head around the fact that um, all of the scaremongers aren't necessarily right. And you need to you need to advocate for yourself and you need to become an informed citizen of, of the, the globe. Um, yeah. And yeah, so that's probably a loss of loss of fear, which is a good thing to, to lose. Mm -hmm. you know, a life lived in fear is a life half lived is a, an expression that I think resonates. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, especially in this time right now, when we just all the headlines are COVID this, that, this, the other thing, this falling apart, and we're sequestered in our houses, and there's a world raging on outside that seems to be all breaking down, and then you take a walk in the world, and it's kind of like, ah, it's not as uh, much of a <laughs> burning shit as the internet. I mean, there's, there's adversity for sure, um, but it's very easy to fall, fall to, to a fearful way of thinking. Um, what do you think is a, a key to your having dropped that fear, Jade? I think it's, it's just maturity and understanding the, the, the world better. Um, and I think also feeling more of a, a sort of larger sense of community, like you, you sort of hook on to the more positive people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the following up on what Vanessa was saying is, you know, mm -hmm. the, the people that you choose to be around, you, you, yeah. you follow people, you respect people um, who care about, you know, caring, caring about the community, I think is, is absolutely key. And, um, and that's another thing is, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting reckless fear, like don't go out there without your vaccinations and your masks and all that stuff. It's like, there's a sense of responsibility to your community as well that I think um, if everyone accepts a sense of responsibility, then we can all support one another and we can live increasingly without fear. And that also means, you know, supporting one another in terms of supporting the arts too, of course, because I think arts create community more than anything else does. Oh, yeah, I agree. And Ves Vanessa, what about you? A quality that you uh, felt you needed to shed? I think fear is a pretty great one. I, I don't know that I have shed it. I mm. do it for years. <laughs> like a tulip bulb. <laughs> I, um, I had a fear this morning and then I had a solution and so a friend of mine in Cuba is a great doctor and they're leaving they're going to be carted by coyotes hopefully to get to the United States and I, and I was thinking man I wish I had the the guts to say I I know what to do I know how to sponsor you it's not a close close friend but a friend of a friend and somebody I have a respect for and um I had this thought this morning, sort of back to this idea of the company you keep and staying in conversation with good company. I'm like, okay, so who do I know? And like, I had this fantasy that I could call up somebody I know in federal politics and say, listen, 
about to like put his life in danger. We need doctors. Like every day we're hearing, you know, all the problems. We don't have doctors. There's doctors like my, my friend could literally be working here, helping the society, having the opportunity that he wants for himself. I have mixed feelings about us brain draining other countries of origin that also need help at this time. But I think again, like the, the opportunity to ask more of our policymakers and our politicians and ourselves and our own network. So when we see something and it feels uncomfortable, be able to think about, well, just for me, I'm not saying everybody is driven in the same solution-based, some people call it, a, what do they call it? Um, in positivity porn or something like that. <laughs> but I got a big case of it. And um, you have always been so positive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel the blues. I have blues. This was a lousy month. It's probably the worst month of my life. This, I had the COVID. I felt sad. I felt scared about everything as well, too, for the first time in this whole COVID. I was like, I used to be like, I'm feeling okay. And I'm looking, are you really okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I'd be like, ask my friends, if I seem okay. Yeah, I'm fine until this month. I was like, oh, now it's happening. And, but back to this, what am I losing is really just the continually shedding of my own sense of small in effectualness when in fact I can be as effective as I can be. And it's just my little life and I try my best until I die and they throw dirt in my face. But in the interim, I don't want my friend to die being, you know, trying to get free to practice medicine in a place that actually um, will live, let him live how he wants to. And I wish if, um, anybody in federal politics is online right now, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards about a new plan for getting um, medical workers from other countries that are waiting yeah. in camps. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I'd like to ask Michael, Michael, do we have more questions? We're coming towards the end of our, our panel. Um, Michael, what are some questions for, for our guests? Uh, yes. Um, uh, during this time of COVID, uh, we've been thinking about what live performance means in digital term in digital terms. Mm -hmm. uh, we have all. Uh, what have all three of you thought about the, the meaning of live performance in relation to punk music, but also the limits and advantage of, of performances in the di in digital spaces? Mm. <laughs> is just not the same it you know i'm sorry there's there's lots of great stuff out there online but mm -hmm. but as soon as you get into a room with mm -hmm. actual people and actual musicians and it just it makes a huge difference so i don't you know i don't want that to be discouraging i think there's there's lots of i mean on the other hand it also provides access so i think that's one thing that is really good about the digital era is i've been able to attend a lot of attend mm -hmm. A lot of things that I wouldn't have had access to either that uh, otherwise that are you know taking place in various places around the world mm -hmm. so in that sense the digital arena is great but nothing is a substitute for live theater for live music um, and just feeling like you're part of a community because I don't I think it's very hard to achieve that in uh, in the digital realm mm -hmm. yeah I, um, and uh, Heather well, I mean, I was doing, I was using video phones uh, to link poets and audiences in the early 90s through uh, uh, the Edgewise Electrolyte Center. And it was, an, it was, of course, an experiment then. But now it's interesting to see how we've become, we have to, now we have to rely on this. And we have Zoom, uh, which is so much more uh, uh, facilitate, you know, can facilitate these things so much more readily. We used to have to have two phone lines, one for audio and one for video, and you'd, you'd sit there and watch the, the image scroll down. So anyway, we've come a long way, and I think it's really uh, exciting, and it also indicates our resiliency and our ability to add, adapt, which is what humans are really good at, uh, maybe too good at sometimes. Um, but yeah, as, as Jade said, there's certainly no substitute, um, and I can hardly wait until we can all uh, can re, you know reconvene and, and see each other and dance and and, and um, be together again. And um, it's, it's just uh, incredible too, that, that this is, who, 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 did, who did felt like, like this would happen to us? <laughs> that we'd have to go through all of this, but it certainly also drives home the, um, the idea that we will never ever be able to take anything like that for granted ever again. Like we can never take each other for granted. And for those shared experiences, 
um, I think we really did take all of it for granted. Oh, I'm too tired. I'm gonna wash my hair. I'm not gonna go. You know, I mean, uh, it, 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 can you imagine like just uh, the, those opportunities that we had um, that we we so took for granted? That uh, that's perhaps one thing, one good thing that will that will come out of this. That that people will will appreciate um, those wonderful experiences again, and we're all looking forward to that. <laughs> I yeah, know. I've been. I, I found this entire pandemic very inspiring. Um, I have uh, done tons of video work and, and um, music video work, and also performance work. I just last month um, brought out um, a light and a projector and did a backyard <laughs> uh, performance, and was able to share some of the photography work of Steve Wasney, who was a great Vancouver photographer. I remember that. that. Yeah, that was yeah. cool. Um, and um, I've, I've enjoyed a lot of digital uh, contributions from other artists. I enjoy um, moments that are live as well. Some of the, the spaces allow for live and short duration. People are curating, they're making their own stuff, which is very exciting to me. But I'm a person who's a filmmaker, very ensconced in the media. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I found it to be very exciting. It doesn't uh, replace live at all. I mean, I was very lucky to, there was a, a one month window where the restrictions were uh, laid down and me and some friends put on a show. <laughs> and it was just like packed venue with hot garbage and a, a bunch of bands from Vancouver or not Vancouver, from Toronto and Montreal. And it was outstanding, sold out, packed to the, the rafters. You know, we were, we were checking for um, that everyone was vaccinated. There was no one who got sick out of that. Um, I was able to go to shows and it, I was struck by how resilient people are. It kind of like time collapsed and it was such a joy to share the stage and be in a community um, mm -hmm. and be able to play. But then Om Omicron came up and oh then God. Yeah. collapsed everything again. Here we are again. Yeah. It will be this accordion. Um, yeah. it, it, there is an end to sight. We are adaptable, but I was struck by how, how it, 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 we all fell back into it pretty easily. And we all kind of are falling back into this more restricted time easily, to, more easily too. We all have to like give up certain things. I've had to give up tons of really fun stuff. I oh, can't yeah. go to New York for uh, an, uh, oh, yeah. a, a, a debut of a screening of a movie that I was in. I can't do a bunch of stuff, but a bunch of shows have been canceled, but you kind of yeah. go, okay, well, that's what it is. And you abide to this moment. And this is what yeah. it is right now. I published a book uh, in 2020 and I, I I keep saying, yeah, I'm going to have a book lunch party. You know, I'm going to do a little book tour <laughs> I keep, uh, next month, this spring, you know, and it keep, now it's two years. And I'm, oh my God, you know, and yeah. And I was going to invite people over for New Year's Eve and then yeah, Omicron, you yeah, know, oh my God, but yeah. Uh, the only way out is through and uh, we will get through this and it, it, it'll it's only a matter of time <laughs> Just have... yeah yeah and there's all, all sorts of stuff like you know having to contend with the world that you knew disintegrate outside of yourself really i think it forces us to see what is important mm -hmm. and to also as you say be very grateful for what was for yeah. what will be what is now and cherish our loved ones and... i know and we're going to close i think it's Great that we're closing soon so people can get to the rest of the afternoon and we can leave them wanting a little more. So <laughs> what's up for me and this moment, I really think it's a great opportunity for all of us, myself. I definitely spent more time getting to be better company with myself mm -hmm. and really paying attention to the long line of struggle that all of our ancestors came through. Yeah. And person who's alive on the planet has ancestors that endured and persevered mm. and got through and sometimes turning to those stories can be good company for us yes um they don't have to come from your own seemingly ancestral lineage but keeping in mind that all of us we are really family right like in seven generations it's like something like 256 people had to mate for you to be here and you go back 14 years and it's like you give there's a lot of people and we're connected it's true just like the song says. But here, here what? I, here I throw down the gauntlet, friends, and ask everybody to think, figure out like what are the ways that we can be together? Here's just a couple of things that I did during the um, experience so far, and they really served me well. I think that's why I felt okay for so long. Mm -hmm. 
dance parties outside with your own playlist. We have a Spotify shared playlist. Me and my friends would get out there. Cheryl Rossi, I see you in the crowd. And we would like put songs in and um, we'd put on our own headphones and then we'd, okay, we're gonna play this song, we'd press play, but da 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 And then we'd dance for a couple of songs. People come, would come back again, you know, six feet apart and say, okay, what are the next songs? And we'd laugh and play and figure out the technology. And then we'd play the next set of songs and we'd be like dancing out in the field in the dark. Very, very fun, very great, very easy, very freaking rewarding. Something I wish there was somebody here to show you with. Oh, I'll use this pillow. Adaptive people. That's what we're going to be. Back hugs, you know, like it hard. We're all missing hugs. And who hangs out in the front hug anyways? It's like, ooh, um, you do it for a few moments and you press on. Now, listen, if you go to somebody and you just like push your back to back, they're facing that way. So their breath and their germs are that way. And you're germing out that way. It's like, <laughs> And your vagus nerves touch, like this one that runs down from the top of your brain into your guts and lets you know whether it's safe to be where you are. All of a sudden you feel safe because somebody literally has your back. People, it's a good solution. Those are two for taking Whoa, into that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we were saying that we wanted to keep econom economize this talk, leave people wanting more as you know, timeless entertainers we are. And yet this has gone for a very long time. And I so appreciate um, all of your time and, and sharing the experiences and insights. And I really appreciate all the people that joined us online. Um, and I, I wish you all well. I, uh, hopefully this uh, conversation we'll see, uh, will be uploaded on YouTube for others to see. I think there's a lot of great, great advice to share here and, and great experiences to find out about. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Sukyun. Good job. Thank you so much. You're great. Great. So, so honored to be here. Oh, yeah. It's been great. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. It's been a pleasure.